Hello, everybody, and welcome to our penultimate brown bag of the year in the Knaus Fellowship. I would just like to tell everyone that our last Knaus Brown Bag is going to be on January 16th, and Amanda Carter will be presenting then. But today we have the wonderful Catherine Friends, who is a PhD student at Michigan State University. Her professional interests include figuring out how policy works in social ecological systems, stealing social science methods to apply to natural science questions, and talking about narrative structure in science writing. When she's not writing her dissertation, you can find her at Old Time Music Jams or under a tree with a book. So I'm going to pass this off to Catherine. Thank you. Um, this presentation that I'm doing Thank you. Can you hear me now? So before I get started, I have a few acknowledgments. Um, first, thanks to the Canal Seminar Committee and the library for this opportunity. Um, I don't, if you work at NOAA, you probably don't spend enough time in the library because these people are amazing. Um, secondly, I need to acknowledge my advisor, who is not a co-author on this presentation because he has not seen it yet, but without <laughs> whom this research uh, never would have happened. So let's get started. Um, oh, and I forgot to say I didn't take any of these pictures, but almost all of the pictures in this presentation are of my study systems. So uh, if you think this is beautiful, you probably want to go visit Northern Michigan or New York. So the broad topic of this talk and my dissertation in general is policy and conservation. In recent years, scientists have started to realize that the kind of large-scale conservation that we need to conserve biodiversity, uh, land cover, ecosystem services over the next generations is going to necessitate a policy solution. So we need to be making policy aimed at conservation. This kind of policy can come in a lot of forms. It can be land acquisition, like uh, public land, national parks, land use, like zoning, uh, or land management, like things like prescribed burns and other kinds of management actions. Uh-oh, uh, there, there we go. So what kinds of policy are we talking about here? For this presentation, I'll be focusing on land use policy. And this slide is showing Yellowstone National Park, which is an exemplar of the more traditional uh, settler American view of conservation we call it fortress conservation. Basically what this means is that the protected area is separate from people. So nobody lives permanently in Yellowstone anymore. There are no cities in there. Um, there are very few roads that cut through there and it's surrounded by these other uh, national forest wilderness areas that are meant to protect the park from outside influences. So we have these two separate systems, the natural system and the human system. In reality, we're running out of wilderness in the world. So between increasing human resource use, increasing population, we have people using most of the places where we need biodiversity to be conserved, especially many of the biodiversity hotspots. And this kind of use ranges from a dirt road going through a forest, through logging um, and other kinds of forest management, through actual settlements being built on the landscape. So we have this variety of human use I'm calling it the full world because to me that kind of signifies that uh, we, we don't have wilderness to just set aside and protect anymore. Um, we have to conserve in landscapes that humans are also using. So these kinds of landscapes I'm referring to as mixed use landscapes. And the central question, one of the central questions of my dissertation is how to conserve biodiversity on mixed use landscapes. So there are a couple of approaches. The approach that will be most familiar, I think, to most Americans is to have some public land that we protect and then leave the rest up to individual landowners and localities. 
So an individual landowner might be a land trust, might be a logging company, it might be someone who raises corn on their back 40. Um, localities, especially in the United States, are generally responsible for a lot of the land use policy, especially in terms of zoning, um, but also in terms of other land use planning. A second approach, which has been more uh, popularized in recent decades, is large-scale comprehensive land use planning. That's one of the things I'm going to talk about today. About 13 of the United States right now have comprehensive growth management plans, which is a major uptick since the 1990s. And uh, these plans attract quite a bit of controversy. Um, there are a number of arguments and claims being made on all sides. So we're gonna look at some of the ones that are central. So on this side, you have a, and we'll call her an environmentalist, um, and the plan often made by conservationists and environmentalists is that this kind of cohesive, large-scale land use policy that we're talking about today is necessary to conserve biodiversity, which makes sense, right? Um, comprehensive land use planning has been shown to slow down growth and preserve, prevent urban sprawl. Preserving natural land cover, we would think, preserves or will conserve biodiversity. However, very little data exists on this hypothesis. Similarly, in regions where you have this kind of land use planning, you'll often find local landowners, uh, real estate developers, and that kind of stakeholder group saying, well, you know, this, this large scale planning, whether or not it's conserving biodiversity is bad for my local economy. It's driving down property values, destroying jobs. You find a lot of arguments in this vein. But we don't know, uh, right? This, this kind of planning has not been popular for very long. Um, and we don't really know what to do with these different claims, even though policy is being made on the basis of some of these claims. So in order to make better policy, we really have to unravel some of what's going on here. Which brings us to the research questions I studied. Uh, first is addressing that first claim, is biodiversity on mixed use landscapes higher in the presence of regional scale land planning? Second, are human communities on mixed use landscapes worse off in the presence of regional land use planning than in its absence? And finally, does, th this is a little complicated, so stick with me. Does regional scale land use planning affect the success of smaller scale conservation actions? So if you think of regional land use planning as this umbrella, right, and you have other stuff going on here. So even though you have regional land use planning, you still have things like zoning, local planning, public land, uh, the farm bill, things like that going on in the context of that region. And that's what this third research question is trying to look at. So we're gonna go through some methods. Um, I'm gonna try to make this as non-painful as possible. Um, so if you wanna nerd out about statistics, we can do that later, but we will not be doing it here. I'm gonna go through my two study areas. Uh, the first one is the Adirondack Park of Northern New York. And just to keep you oriented, you will see this little picture of the outline of the park in the corner of the slides in which I'm talking about the park. So uh, this is one of the oldest protected areas in the country. It makes up about a fifth of the landmass of New York. And it is within a day's drive of New York City, as well as a big hunk of the Eastern seaboard. So Historically, really popular vacation area. Um, and we'll... So land management in the Adirondack Park is very unique. This text on the slide is from the New York State Constitution and it establishes all the green land in the map as it is state forest land. And the clause in the Constitution estab uh, establishes all that land as forever wild. So it is absolutely protected for all time. You're not allowed to log it. You're not allowed to build on it. However, the Adirondack Park as a whole is not just the forest preserve land. It is everything within that outline. The white stuff is private land, but um, even the whole park, including the private land, is managed by the Adirondack Park Agency. They have a statewide system or a, a region-wide system of zoning. This is a state level board. Perhaps you can see where we're going in terms of controversy. Um, the Adirondack Park Agency was established in the 1970s and they, um, they write up the state land master plan, which again only applies to the green, but
but they also have a state level zoning that applies to the whole thing. So that was study area number one. Study area number two is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, um, also known as God's Country. Um, and you will see that outline when we're talking about the Upper Peninsula. So this is a this is a map of just some of the land management things that are going on in Upper Michigan. Um, as you can see, it's pretty heterogeneous. There are a lot of national forests, a lot of state forest area. Um, there are land trusts. There are private forests owned by logging companies. There are private forests owned by real estate companies. There are four relatively sizable cities um, and zoning here happens almost exclusively at the township level. In terms of things like history, human settlement, population density, climate, wildlife communities, the two study areas are very similar. So in addition to topography um, and coastline, the main thing that makes these places different is the form of land use policy. So in the Adirondack Park, you have this really cohesive one agency top-down planning, and in the UP, you have this. I call it the wild west of land use planning. Uh, so our, for our first analysis, we looked at differences between these two regions. Our hypothesis was based on the claims that we went through before. So because of the centralized planning in the Adirondack Park, we expect biodiversity to be higher because that's one of the goals of planning and human socioeconomic well-being to be lower than in the UP. So for our uh, response variables, we had two metrics of biodiversity, species richness, which you all know what that is, and uh, biotic integrity, which is just a weighted measure of species richness uh, based on the sensitivity of the species to human disturbance. I used bird communities for this one, and the data is from breeding bird atlases, which are um, done on a state-by-state -state basis, but are pretty standardized as far as methodology, or simil pretty, pretty similar as far as methodology, timing. It just so happens that Michigan and New York both did a breeding bird atlas in 2000. So that's the time frame that we're looking at. We also looked at a set of five human well-being variables. I picked these metrics because as far as I could tell, they had not been studied in either study area before and because they represent some different aspects of human well-being. So the poverty rate, generally recognized by everybody as a bad thing. Uh, then I picked second homes and the Gini index of income to represent inequality. And finally, because people, stakeholders in these two regions uh, worry a lot about demographics. They worry about uh, population loss, towns dying, elementary schools dying. So I chose both population change and the percentage of the population that's under 30 to represent demographics. Data is all from the US Census. Uh, it's publicly available. So you could do this analysis if you wanted to. Uh, the predictor that we're interested in in this analysis is just region. So I controlled a lot of other variables. We're not going to worry about them yet. That's the first analysis. The second analysis is within regions. So we have a slightly different hypothesis here. Uh, we hypothesize that in both regions, protected land and zoning will be positively associated with biodiversity, negatively associated with human well-being um, across study areas, regardless of that umbrella policy context. Same biodiversity metrics, that's the Kirtland's warbler, it was just delisted. Uh, same human well-being metrics, uh, but measured at the township level. They were measured at the township level in the first analysis too, but I forgot to say that. So here are predictors and you don't need to remember all of them. Uh, we've got a lump of three policy variables, two types of public land and township level zoning. Ask me about getting those, the zoning data <laughs> later on. Um, we have four land cover variables from the national land cover database. Uh, and we have travel time to, to the nearest population center because the literature seems to suggest that that might be important. And we have township area because of the species area relationship. So this is as close as we're gonna to get to an equation, I promise. Um, so for the biodiversity metrics, we uh, assume that biodiversity is going to be predicted by a combination of policy variables, land cover variables, and the area of the township. 
for well-being metrics, we assume that those would be proportional to uh, or be predicted by a combination of the policy land cover and the distance to the nearest city. So I'm going to take you through some results. And I wish this moose wasn't quite so skeptical looking. Uh, so our between the this first bit is going to be our between regions results and look for these outlines in the corner later on. So again, what we're really testing here is whether this unified system of land use planning is good for biodiversity, bad for human well-being or not, as opposed to this very patchwork uh, system of many different agencies and landowners. And we find that it's not. So when we're comparing biodiversity between study regions, obviously there are differences in the two metrics, but not differences in each metric between locations. So biodiversity is essentially the same in both of our regions. So that's kind of cool. It gets a little different when we're comparing well-being between study regions. Um, here you see the Gini index is about the same. The poverty rate is about the same in both locations. However, in the Adirondack Park, we see a higher percentage of second homes than in the UP. We see actual population growth as opposed to population loss. And we see a higher population of people under 30 than we do in the, in the UP. So um, I'm going to discuss those later, but for now, just remember that we have um, the Adirondack Park is doing about the same as the UP on two of our metrics, better on two and worse on one. That would be second homes because we're here assuming that second homes represent a certain aspect of inequality. So our within region results were a little bit different. Um, you're going to be seeing these tables throughout the stars or the asterisks mean it is uh, it was a statistically significant result but i'm going to tell you the interesting parts so you don't have to worry about reading the table so this is not actually an interesting part um, area was significant in um in predicting both metrics of, bio of biodiversity we know about this we've known about this for a very long time um, it's the species area relationship i'm not going to talk about it anymore more interesting, in the Adirondack Park, we found that land cover was actually more significant in predicting biodiversity than policy. Policy can be shaped by land cover, but we saw some relationships here that were unexpected. So we see coniferous forest having a positive impact on both metrics, wooded wetland having a negative impact on both metrics, agriculture for some reason having a positive impact. Um, we think the, the effect of agriculture is likely because in the Adirondack Park, agriculture is vanishingly rare. Um, so it creates edges and it creates habitat that you don't find elsewhere in the park. I don't have a good explanation for the other two yet, um, but what is interesting here to me is that uh, land cover is so much more important than uh, policy in predicting biodiversity. All right, results in well-being uh, for, again, for the Adirondack Park. So the first thing that I want to talk about is that uh, this covariate, land managed for biodiversity, which is um, the Adirondack Park, it's most of the state forest land. In the UP, it is mostly national forest, uh, but the management standards are the same. So in the Adirondack Park, if you manage land for biodiversity, you find in the same township a lower poverty rate and a lower percentage of young people. So one thing we could say is that because uh, land managed for biodiversity promotes tourism, it also promotes jobs. However, I think that's unlikely because of the lower under 30 population. So I think what's going on here is actually an effect on the real estate market. Um, and we see this in the literature too, where public land acts as an environmental amenity. It's nice to have a national forest in your backyard. In this case, it's nice to have state land in your backyard. So it's going to price poor and younger people out of the real estate market in that township. So this looks on the surface like land managed for biodiversity is doing some good things for our economy. I think this is actually a symptom of something wrong. 
uh, also like you to note that zoning in the Adirondack Park is behaving kind of funny. So in areas with zoning, we see an increase in second homes and a decline in the population under 30. And again, this is, this is Adirondack specific because the Adirondack Park has that park-wide zoning system I told you about. To qualify as having zoning in this analysis, a township has had to opt out of the park-wide zoning and get its own plan in place. Uh, a lot of townships like this because it's a form of local control. They do have to get their plan approved by the Adirondack Park Agency, but they can say, okay, this is what works for our municipality. So what this, these results are suggesting is that taking control away from the state and giving it to local governments here is detrimental to human well-being, which is the opposite of the narrative you usually get. We'll discuss that later. Um, for now, we're gonna go on to results from the UP. So biodiversity results here are quite a bit different. The first thing you notice is that land management for biodiversity in the UP is effective. Results in higher biodiversity on both metrics. So whatever we're doing to promote biodiversity is working, but only in this study region. Oh no. There we, oh, that was the only interesting thing that happened here, actually. <laughs> Not very much going on, except for area again. So in terms of well-being, again, pretty heterogeneous results, and they're different than in the Adirondack Park. So for whatever reason, we see uh, wooded wetland, again, playing a major role in well-being. Can't tell you why. This is why I'm still working on my dissertation, because um, I keep getting results like this. Uh, developed land as expected, has a pretty significant influence on several aspects of well-being. So uh, it's associated with the decline in the percentage of second homes, which is expected. Most people want their country home in the country. Um, it is associated with an increase in the under 30 population and an increase in population as a whole. This is significant because the UP as a whole has lost population, uh, but more developed areas are gaining population within the UP. Same thing with young people. Um, more developed areas are attracting more people and more younger people than other places. Fewer second homeowners. So what does all of this mean? We're gonna go back to our research questions here. So recall that the first research question was, is biodiversity on mixed use landscapes higher in the presence of regional scale land, land use planning? So we would think it would be higher in the Adirondack Park. And it's not. Uh, regional planning is not associated with higher biodiversity in this study yet. Um, we can't discount the possibility that because this study was a snapshot in time, that conditions that led to these results may change in the future. And this was actually one of the things that the folks who put the forever wild clause in the New York Constitution were thinking about. Um, they talked about preserving the land in perpetuity for future generations. So this is actually a possibility that they thought about 100 years ago, we're thinking about now, which is kind of cool. Second question, are human communities on mixed use landscapes worse off in the presence of regional land use planning? No, not that either. So in overall, we didn't find that uh, regional land use planning is killing the economy. Um, we found that people are on four of five metrics as well off or better off in our system that had regional planning. We also have some corroborating uh, qualitative research by Bauer et al. just this past, came out just this past summer, um, showing that this is generally a trend across the country. So if you compare the Adirondack Park to most other rural areas, it's doing better um, by most metrics of human development. So that's interesting. I can't get this clicker to work, sorry. Uh, so our third question, does regional scale land use planning affect the success of smaller scale conservation actions? Uh, that answer was, yeah, it does. Um, so management effectiveness is context dependent when it comes to promoting biodiversity. Uh, for example, management for biodiversity is effective in the absence of regional land use planning. So only in the UP, not in the Adirondack Park, did we see management for biodiversity actually resulting in higher biodiversity. 
Local zoning, on the other hand, is detrimental in the presence of regional planning, whereas without regional planning, it is not detrimental. So we have heterogeneous results based on the planning umbrella context that we started off with. We have the same thing for impacts on humans. So we found that more urbanized areas in the UP are attracting both growth and younger people, but there are more of both of those things in the Adirondack Park, which does not have the same level of urbanization, slightly higher in the UP. So we're not sure what's going on there either, but we can tell that in these areas that are very similar in terms of most human development things, this land management context seems to be making a difference as far as how people or how human communities work. In previous studies, like I mentioned, we found that protected land, not we, other people, have found that protected land attracts development around the edges. We did not find that in this analysis. So again, context dependent, even in contrast with the literature. So that brings us back to these claims that we have to know about to make good land use policy. Main conclusions, if you don't remember anything else, if you got lost, come back with me. We're going to go through these. So conclusions, top-down regional land use planning does not increase biodiversity now, but it may be an investment in future conservation. And that's the subject of my third chapter. <laughs> top-down regional land use planning doesn't decrease human well-being, and in some cases might increase it. And the effects of public land and zoning depend on the regional planning context. There may be trade-offs between the two scales. So if you've invested in conservation on one scale, you may need to invest less on the smaller scale or vice versa. So to conclude with that, to kind of iron out some of this controversy, um, I think we can say that regional land use planning is a viable tool for conserving biodiversity without jeopardizing human communities. So in these mixed use landscapes where you want to accomplish biodiversity conservation and you also want to have thriving human communities, it seems like regional land use planning of the style done in the Adirondack parks is a viable tool for accomplishing both of those things. And I will take any questions either from here or online and thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you so much for that presentation, Catherine. I just wanted to make a quick note. We have these um, microphones and they're actually for the online audience. So if you guys wouldn't mind holding them when you do have a question, so. Go ahead. Could you go to your methods to your first hypothesis? A little further back. Oh, you want the, the first hypothesis? Right, yeah. That one. <clears throat> um, oh. Why do you assume that biodiversity will be higher in a park situation when you're not considering the impacts of climate change or other, you know, stressors that are coming into the boundaries of the park? Yeah, um, it's the answer is because we're comparing between two locations. So the two locations we're looking at have approximately the same climate. And those climates have changed in terms of warming in about the same ways. So because we're doing a, a snapshot of two locations at one time, uh, we assume that those would be about the same. The second answer to your question is that um, in the research that I did early on in my dissertation, um, I found in the literature that in general land use change is a bigger stressor than climate change so far. Hmm. Great, thank you. Thanks for your presentation, Catherine. Um, your conclusion, your first one that says top-down land use planning doesn't increase biodiversity yep. yet. Yep. Like, hasn't that, hap that happened 100 years ago? So when would yet be, like, how would you measure that? You'd think yeah. with 100 years of protection, it would have worked. Yes. 
one of the complicating factors here and one of the drivers behind the idea for this research to begin with was that both these places are cold and inaccessible. Uh, black flies in the summer, two feet of snow and ice in the winter. Um, so neither of them have come under a lot of development pressure yet. Development pressure is accelerating, especially on the East Coast. So we can't, based on this research, I can't say this is going to make a difference in the future. But the people who wrote this clause into the state constitution of New York thought it would. Um, and we have to at least acknowledge that there's a possibility that this is that this system of planning is going to be more important in 200 years than it is now uh, because it is preserved entirely in perpetuity okay any other questions in the room so i found the socioeconomic results to be really interesting i do have a question about them related to the adirondacks so in a lot of ways the Adirondack Park ended up having higher socioeconomic outcomes. I'm wondering if you considered any regional scale results of that, just in that the Adirondack Park is in the Northeast, relatively near a lot of very large wealthy population centers where the UP is away from pretty much everything. Yeah, I did some descriptive statistics on that. I didn't include them because they were very interesting. Um, but a lot of so for example, income inequality is more similar between these two locations than either location is to its respective state. So uh, income inequality in both locations are is much lower than in each state overall. Um, and this is true, the, the Bauer research that I cited also found, finds that in general, um, the, the wealth, the income in rural regions is dependent to a certain extent on the state, but varies more regionally than can be explained by the state context. Thanks. So you mentioned the context dependence of the uh, regional versus local um, conservation policies, and you said that sometimes they can um, work at odds to each other. Um, I was wondering if you'd be willing to speculate about why that happens. Why the, so why some of those trade-offs happen? Yeah, like why one could be detrimental to the success of the other when they coexist. Yeah, in the case, in the case of zoning, it's more complicated than I thought it was when I started the research. Um, so that, uh, and, and that is simply because of the unique system going on in the Adirondacks. So when you have region-wide zoning, local zoning may be detrimental because you're taking away authority from that regional management and investing it in local in the local government these are rural areas local governments are sometimes you know two guys in half a day a week so these aren't people who have a lot of time to communicate and coordinate with one another whereas the state system is managed by professionals in a very cohesive way. So what you're doing in your township over there is coordinated with what is happening in my township over here. Whereas if you basically take yourself out of that plan and say, I'm gonna do my own thing, nobody knows what you're doing. Anyone else? Oh. That turned out to be detrimental in the analysis. Um, I think because generally we find that coordination between local units of government can be beneficial. Uh, in terms of planning for resources that are larger than a local unit of government. So in terms of planning for a watershed, for example, what's going on in Township A affects what's going on in Township B because they share a watershed. Any other questions in the room for now? Okay, we'll check on our online questions. Okay, so the first question is if you could please explain what the Gini index represents. Yes, uh, the Gini index represents the, in, in this case, it's an index of income. So that it's a measure of inequality. Roughly, uh, the it, it represents the distribution of income across society. So in a perfectly unequal society, the Gini index would be 100 or one, and in a perfectly equal society, the Gini index would be 
zero. Um, so it's a, it's a rough estimate of how resources are spread out. Uh, so the next question is that um, similar uh, issues come up in marine context. So based on what you've learned, how would you apply this thinking to marine and coastal contexts? Sure. Um, there is a major difference between terrestrial and marine environments in that one's underwater. Um, <laughs> more interestingly, in that uh, you can sell fish, right? So marine environments have a um, more direct impact on economies than these terrestrial rural environments. The, uh, while there is forestry, mining, things like that going on in these environments, uh, because of globalization, those industries have shrunk significantly since the middle of the century um, and are not generally, you will find less of the population participating in those industries than you will find fishing in um, more coastal communities. Um, especially the the uh, traditional ports. So while these are traditional logging communities, you don't find the same level of uh, industry dependence that you would have found before. So um, that is a major difference that I was not able to, or that I that I would not be able to account for in applying this research to a coastal community. However, I think the idea that top-down planning isn't necessarily bad for people is one that could be universally applied. Um, in the United States, top-down planning tends to be controversial, in part because we have a history of federalism, in part because we have a history of private property rights. People just don't like it. Um, especially in both of my study regions, uh, you have this downstate upstate thing going on um, and people come from different cultures and are suspicious of everybody else's intentions and it's just a messy political thing. I know it's that way in some fishing communities as well. So I think what I would hope um, that research like this would do would be to sort of demystify the idea of top-down planning or um, make it less scary. To local people and say okay this is not necessarily a bad thing for you this and because things are context dependent maybe we have to check but it's not automatically going to be something that's bad okay and another online question we had someone wanted to confirm their correction understanding that there is a sample size of one for each of your land use planning scenarios uh yes however because the analysis was done at the township level mm -hmm. um each region is an amalgamation of those townships. There were 62 in the Adirondack Park mm -hmm. and 142 in the UP. So it wasn't just biodiversity at the regional level. Mm -hmm. um, it was at the township level analyzed by region using a, a two-level model. Okay, great. Um, and then someone also wanted to point out that in the Adirondacks, some of the environmental pressure um, came in the form of uh, effects from outside the park like acid rain and Absolutely. that that's outside of land use planning? Yes, so acid rain is a big deal in the Adirondack Park, um, which I didn't realize until I started studying it. And there definitely are impacts that come from outside the park and outside the region in the UP. We weren't able to control for everything because this is field research rather than laboratory research. So there are definitely differences that we can account for. Okay, so um, last chance for questions. Oh, so ties to that one of the, the end of, oh, sorry, tying to the end of one. So it seems to me that the Upper Peninsula is what happens in most of the US. Yes, that's correct. Uh, is there another area like the Adirondack that you could then get another matching set and have an end of two There's or not. is not? Um, the Adirondack Park is unique. Okay. In there, there are systems that are more similar to it than others, um, but in terms of having that single state agency managing a real big chunk of public-private land, it's unique. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if some of the Southern Appalachians, you looked at that and considered that in terms of the amalgam there? It might not be a... Yeah, um, I did actually, and the, there's a regional planning authority in part of Appalachia as well. However, 
that authority, which I'm forgetting the name of, um, it, the acronym confused me because it's similar to the Adirondacks acronym. Um, that planning authority is more focused on economic development rather than land use planning specifically. Uh, so I wasn't able to make that comparison because of the, uh, the different goals of the regional planners. Um, I believe the Appalachian Planning Agency is also uh, not, it doesn't have statutory authority over land use. It has economic development incentives, um, but it can't prohibit certain land uses in the way that the Adirondack Park Agency can. And a um, question about the Adirondack Agency. What is the degree of local representation on that agency? I can't give you those numbers off the top of my head. There are, um, there is local representation on the agency by statute. There has to be. Um, in addition, in recent years, partly because of the fuss that was kicked up in the 70s over the agency, uh, town, towns in the park have uh, veto authority over new public land acquisition that happens within their borders. So uh, what, what is interesting is that none of the towns, to my knowledge, have used that veto authority yet. So despite the claims that the forest preserve is bad for a local economy, towns have yet to say no to more forest preserve land. And there has been more forest preserve land. Yes, there has been forest preserve land added. Um, and there's always debate over how it should be zoned, whether we should allow motor motorized recreation or not is the big debate. Um, but towns have, I think they've had the authority for you know what, I'm not even gonna say, because I, I will be wrong. Um, they've had the authority for long enough that they could have used it and nobody has used it yet. Okay, any additional questions here? All right, I will just check with our online audience as well. So, okay, I think uh, that is it for questions. So um, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah, thanks.